from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My name is Lulu Garcia Navarro. I'm a host at National Public Radio. Um, it is my pleasure to be here today. And um, I have a few words uh, from the National Book Festival that I have been asked to read. Um, all day here at the Library of Congress National Book Festival, we are recognizing and celebrating the importance of reading authors and books. The Library of Congress makes it seem easy to do this every year, but in truth, the National Book Festival is a huge undertaking. And I feel very comfortable doing this because I am from NPR. We're going to now ask you for some money. <laughs> um, this room has been made possible by the generous support of our sponsors, the James Madison Council. Um, so please consider making a contribution right now uh, on your cell phone. You can send a text to make a one-time gift that will be added to your mobile phone bill. We should think about that at NPR. In fact, <laughs> note to self. Uh, the details are on the screen and on the back of your program. Please contribute. Obviously, books and these kinds of events um, are expensive undertakings. So. Thank you for considering making a donation right now. And on with our program, it is my absolute pleasure and honor to introduce you today um, an author who has done, I think, so much for our understanding of medicine and science and all that goes into it. Um, he wrote the book, The Emperor of All Maladies, uh, which was considered one of the most uh, notable books when it came out um, by the New York Times and so many others. He is a cancer doctor practicing. Um, he is also a scientist and researcher at Columbia University. And he has now written uh, the book, The Gene, An Intimate History, which is an astonishing work. Um, I can attest having just finished it. Um, so I would like you to give a very warm welcome right now to Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to start by saying, and I did say this to him before, I, um, come, that I'm neither a scientist nor um, a doctor. I don't come with any particular knowledge of the medical profession. Uh, I am actually a storyteller. And what was astonishing to me about this book is the stories um, about the people who have made, this, made these incredible discoveries and continue to make these incredible discoveries. Uh, but I wanted to start with you. <laughs> And why you chose to write this book now. You started with a book about sort of illness. And this is about the very essence of life. Um, so the, the, the genesis of this book is, is a little complicated. Um, really, the three things that came together in, in, in this book. Um, I, I, when I finished uh, Emperor of All Maladies, um, I thought I was done. Um, there's uh, the, uh, the English who can specialize in snipey comments, um, uh, reviewers, um, wrote, there was a review of Emperor of All Maladies, and uh, I, I, that book won the Guardian First Book Prize. And someone wrote, the, one of the reviewers wrote, it should have been awarded the Guardian Only Book Prize, uh, because that was my book, and I was done with it. Um, but then. Three things happened, and those three things are relevant. Number one is that the question of cancer, which was what I was studying in the laboratory, the question of cancer um, demands the question of normalcy. If cancer is the altered self, um, what is the self? How do, we, how do we become ourselves? How do we develop a normalcy anatomically, physiologically? Um, and where do, where do the boundaries of that definition lie? Um, we'll, come to the, we'll come to how astonishingly contemporary this question has become as of the last mm. few weeks. But nonetheless, so there was that question. So it was inspired by, by, by the work that I'd done for, for my book on cancer. Um, in fact, when Ken Burns did The Emperor of All Maladies, the question that we came, kept coming back to in the sort of editing room while we were conversing and trying to make that film was, was you know, what, what is normalcy? Mm. How, how, do we, how do our bodies know to become what they become? So this question was in my mind a lot. Um, the second strand was uh, something was going on in the world of science and technology. Th that is that we had begun to read and write human genes, human genetics, um, in a way that was truly unprecedented. And by, really, by this I mean 
the deciphering of the human genome, reading it, um, attributing meaning to it, um, and of course, technologies such as CRISPR, which began to allow us to make directed interventions into the human genome, change our genomes sort of at will. This is the gene editing technology. This is the gene editing technology. We'll talk about all of that. Yes. Um, but these techniques, you, you know, since this book has come out, of course, have been very widely now dispersed. But these, from the, from the vantage point of science, sitting in the laboratory, you could already sense bubblings of this. Um, CRISPR was in our news uh, long before, of course, it was in very public news. Uh, in, in the gene, I made the prediction um, that we would see the birth of genetically altered human embryos 10 years from this book. In fact, it was less than 10 months from this book um, that, that, actually, that it actually occurred. So, so there was that. So in other words, th there was a, a kind of gas chamber, gas pressure mm. of, of technology that was pushing like a piston against our understanding of who we were, what, 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 what are we, what are we like, um, how, what happens when we change it. So it was that second arena, second set of concerns. But the third, probably the most important, um, was my father was, was dying while I was writing this book. And I was having conversations with him about our own family history of mental illness, mm. of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder in particular. Um, and those conversations went from very abstract conversations. You know, there was this story of my, my brother, my nephew, um, my cousin, his brother, his nephew. Um, but then those became very personal questions. Would, would I want to scan my own genes to unveil um, potential risks for mental illness. What would that mean? How would that change the way you, I imagine? How would the way it change the way, let's say, you had um, uh, some illness some, with a small genetic component or maybe a large genetic component tracking through your family? And all of a sudden, the capacity to decipher that prospectively became available. Would you do it? Uh, what would that mean for us? broadly speaking. So these three strands, just to remind ourselves again, number one, uh, um, a, a kind of leftover question from the Emperor of All Maladies about cancer. Number two, the bubblings of completely new sciences, uh, science and technological um, uh, uh, out, really uh, scientific and technological breakthroughs that allowed us to uh, intervene and understand our genes in a way that hadn't happened before. And number three, a very personal history of mental illness sort of came together in, in this book. That's how this book was born. I, I want to get to the last two specifically of what, you, um, of what you've just mentioned. But first, one of the things that's really um, wonderful about this book is that you delve into the history. And, and I think that um, it is so important to understand where we are now to look back at, at what has happened before. Uh, and in particular, uh, as we were just talking before we got to the stage, we were talking about um, the history of eugenics in America. And there are so many cautionary tales here. Let's talk about a little bit about what eugenics was and, and that history. Uh, so, the, the history comes in, in three or four phases, and it's important to recognize these phases because each one is a step towards something. Mm. Um, the word eugenics, the idea of eugenics, of course, is an ancient idea. Um, Plato writes about it. Um, the idea that you can somehow make better human beings by intervening on heredity uh, through marriage or through... Um, whatever other means, is an, is an ancient idea. It's, it's a kind of, uh, uh, it's an idea that comes up over and over again. But the word really is coined um, by Francis Galton. Um, he was, as many of you know, cousin of Darwin's, a, um, uh, a philosopher, a scientist, a mathematician, a statistician. And when Galton thought about the idea, it was quite widely embraced by um, the intellectual elite of, of Great Britain. Hmm. This was thought to be a progressive idea. This was thought to be an idea that, you know, somehow if you did better breeding, um, you would get uh, improvements in human race, and it was projected as a way to make us better faster, uh, grasping 
the whole the, the horns of 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 uh, selection mm. um, and and thereby improving the human race it was considered a and many many progressives um, uh, in in Great Britain signed on to it uh, there were big conferences held in fancy locations like like this one in, in you know where the, the idea was trotted out very proudly as a mechanism. famous authors by I mean, famous oh, exactly you know, um, and there's a whole read. list of people yeah. doctors authors wells and all sorts of other people. yeah wells he uh, he was just one of uh, many. absolutely many um, there were dissenting voices too we'll come back to that in a, in, in a second um, Chesterton very famously a dissent, dissent, uh, dissenting voice but nonetheless that's the first phase, positive selection, positive breeding, breeding as eugenics. Then it moves to the United States. Um, it's, an off, it's, it's interesting that, that, um, that the United States phase of eugenics is often neglected. Hmm. But this was a, the a surprise to me. Yeah, it's an, the adolescence of eugenics occurs right here. It, it, it moves to society very obsessed with... Um, with uh, a, a kind of uh, technological and, and you know a kind of uh, re-engineering of, of social uh, of, of, of social structures, um, um, and and so it's in the United States before Nazi Germany. It's in the United States that the, that, that provides a kind of fertile soil for the second phase of eugenics. And here the emphasis moves um, from just uh, uh, breeding to sterilization. And it is here that the idea of sterilizing those that are uh, people that are considered eugenically um, unfit is really born and brought into legal uh, into into the legal system. So it changes from trying to make a better human to getting rid of humans that are not good. That's right. In getting that rid perception. of humans through sterilization. Right. To, to the, so so the right. so the human beings that are being eliminated in the in in this second. Obviously, uh, uh, um, my, obviously, more compromised phase of eugenics is through sterilization, and the Nazis pick up this idea as genetics itself moves on, and it's and, and they then convert this into extermination. So it moves from positive breeding to sterilization to extermination. Exterminate the people who are unfit, um, but it's 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 impossible. To, it is very convenient in the United States to ignore this second uh, phase, but it's impossible to ignore it. Uh, not far from here, uh, there were institutions, state institutions, sponsored by the state, paid for by the state, where the sterilized uh, were being sterilized, where the, uh, the unfit were being sterilized. The book is dedicated to Carrie Buck as a reminder um, uh, of that moment. Remind us briefly who Carrie Buck was. Carrie Buck was um, one of the first um, victims of this sterilization effort. She was a woman who um, was deemed to be mentally unfit. Um, she was deemed to be an, an imbecile. Based on what we know about the historical record, it's very unlikely uh, that she was anything of this. She was, uh, uh, nonetheless, she was brought to the uh, Virginia State Colony um, and it, at first she was confined as a mechanism of preventing her from having any children. Mm. Um, and later, um, the superintendent of the colony applied to the um, courts, first to the colony board and then subsequently the case climbed uh, to the courts, to ask, her to, to ask that she be involuntarily sterilized, uh, her ovaries removed, so that she would not have any more imbecile children. Um, this case climbed all the way to the to the higher courts, and ultimately resulted in in the chilling observation made by Oliver Wendell Holmes that three generations of imbeciles was enough. Um, and with that judgment, um, Carrie Buck was involuntarily sterilized in Virginia, uh, becoming one of the first uh, uh, women to be sterilized under this under this sh under the umbrella of uh, eugenics. Why, what is important about this story in the context of the book and taking us to today? What is it that we need to learn from that? Well, what's uh, the, the back, the strange backstory about this, and I, and I was just, uh, we were just talking about it in, in, the, in the back. I had not, ex I had, I had expect this, expected this book to be scientifically and personally uh, contemporary. I had thought that I would write about 
questions like, what if you were presented with the prospect of sequencing your genome and determining the genetic propensities of your child? Would you do it? What if there was mental illness? I had not, ex what I had not expected was how politically clamorous, the, how, how this book would intersect with the political clamor of our times. Um, it, was, it was just totally unexpected. Uh, you know, the question of supremacy. What does supremacy mean? The question of race. How much do we know about race based on what we know from genes and, and science? Um, the, 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 the confusion and clamor created uh, around questions uh, of what is inherent and what's not, what is intrinsic, what's not intrinsic. Um, the IQ wars. Uh, you know, none of this, I, I had, as I said, I had, the book, the book was called an intimate history. Um, I didn't call it the gene a political history, uh, <laughs> which may have been. Possibly it, you should have. <laughs> possibly, exactly right. Um, but I, I just had not expected um, the way that this would intersect, the book would intersect with very clamorous and, and I would say rather important debates. Uh, about uh, about what's going on today. You wanted to, I, I, I'd like you at this point to read a section of your book um, that I think speaks to this. Um, yeah, I've uh, you know, the, the funny story is that I, I suppose now I could sadly pick up any section of the book and, <laughs> <to> make, it, <laughs> and make it and relevant. Re <laughs> make it relevant. Sign of a good book. Um, the, I thought I'd read this section on race. Um, So somewhere here, let's start somewhere here. Uh, this is about uh, the migration, uh, human migration. Um, um, from here, they went west and north, as young men often do, and then traveled through the gash of the Rift Valley or ducked into the canopies of the rainforest around the Congo Basin, where the Bantu and the Mabuti now live. The story is not geographically contained or as neat as it sounds. Some populations of early modern humans are known to have wandered back into the Sahara, a lush landscape then crisscrossed with finger lakes and rivers, and then eddied back into local pools of humanoids, coexisted and even interbred with them, perhaps generating evolutionary back crosses. As Christopher Stringer, the paleoanthropologist, described it, in terms of modern humans, this meant that some modern humans have more archaic genes than others. That does seem to be so, leading us to ask again, what is modern human? But the long march went on. Some 75,000 years ago, a group of humans arrived at the northeast edge of Ethiopia or Egypt, where the Red Sea narrows into a slit-like strait between the shrugged shoulder of Africa and the downward elbow of the Yemeni Peninsula. There was no one to part the ocean. We don't know what drove the men and women to fling themselves across the water or how they managed to cross it. The sea was perhaps shallower then, and some ge geologists have wondered whether the, chain of, whether the chains of sandbar islands span the strait along which our ancestors hopscotched their way to Asia and Europe. This goes on for a while. Um, but then it comes to a question which gets to the meat of things. What does this tell us about race and genes? A great deal. First, it reminds us that the racial categorization of humans is an inherently limited proposition. Wallace Sayre, the political scientist, liked to quip that academic disputes are often the most vicious because the stakes are so overwhelmingly low. By similar logic, perhaps our increasingly shrill debates on race should begin with the recognition that the actual range of human genomic variation is strikingly low, lower than in many other species, lower, for instance, than in chimpanzees. Given our rather brief tenure on Earth as a species, we're much more alike than unlike each other. It is an inevitable consequence of the bloom of our youth that we haven't even had time to taste the poisoned apple. Yet, even a young species possesses history. One of the most penetrating powers of genetics is its ability to organize even closely related genomes into classes and subclasses. If we go hunting for discriminatory features and clusters, then we will indeed find features and clusters to discriminate. Examined carefully, the variations in the human genome will cluster, importantly, along geographic regions and continents and along traditional boundaries. 
Every genome bears the mark of its ancestries. By studying the genetic characteristics of an individual, you can pinpoint his or her origin to a certain continent, nationality, state, or even tribe with relatively remarkable accuracy. It is, to be sure, an apotheosis of small differences. But if this is what we mean by race, then the concept has not survived the gen genomic era. It has been amplified by it. But the central problem with racial discrimination is not the inference of a person's race from their genetic characteristics. It's the most important point that's raised in this chapter. It is quite the opposite. It is the inference of a person's characteristics from their race. This is a central confusion that runs through um, some of these sort of clamorous debates. The question is not, can you, given an individual's skin color, hair texture, or language, infer something about their ancestry or origin? That is a question of biological systematics, of lineage, of taxonomy, of racial geography, of biological discrimination. Of course you can, and the, gen and the genome has vastly refined that inference. You can scan any individual genome and infer rather deep insights about a person's ancestry or place of origin. But the vastly more controversial question is precisely the converse. Given a racial identity, African or Asian, say, those are in inverted quotes, can you infer anything about an individual's characteristic, not just the skin or care color, but complex features such as intelligence, habits, personality, and aptitude? In other words, genes can tell us about racial origin, but can race tell us anything about genes? To answer that question, we need to measure how genetic variation is distributed across racial categories. Is there more diversity within races or between races? Does knowing that someone is of African versus European descent, say, allow us to refine our understanding of their genetic traits or their personal, physical, or intellectual attributes in a meaningful manner? We know precise and quantitative answers to these questions. A number of studies have tried to quantify the level of genetic diversity of the human genome. The most recent estimates suggest that the vast proportion of genetic diversity, up to 85 to 90 percent, occurs within so-called races, that is within Asians or Africans, and only a minor proportion, about 7 percent, between racial groups. So these are the questions still of our day, which is what is so striking. So, so it, what is what is when you read that? What is the what is the conclusion that you that you draw? Well, the conclusion that we draw is that uh, genomics should have stuffed the genie of racial discrimination back into its bottle. The fact that it hasn't um, is is really a commentary about our our society's new desire to discriminate and a new desire to categorize along uh, racial boundaries. These are Victorian ideas that we inherited. Uh, the fact that, that, you know, these are Victorian ideas that we inherited subclassifying human beings into these categories. Genomics has belied this Victorian idea. The, the, the difference between a man from uh, Namibia and a man from Ethiopia is greater genetically than the difference between a man from uh, uh, Ethiopia and a man from Yemen. We know this because of the nature of migration. And yet, Victorian classifications would put the first two in the same category and the man from Yemen in a, in a different category. That's just false. It, it makes no sense. The fact that we hang on to these ideas, the fact that we, we, we keep with these categories is a reminder not of genetics, but of a certain biological, uh, certain desire, whether biological or not, cultural or biological or not, or the desire to categorize people along boundaries which we sadly inherit from times before science. What is striking to me while reading this book and, 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 dis, and is that these reoccur, but science is often used by scientists to make these distinctions. There are, there are people who use the science to further these erroneous ideas. Absolutely. I mean, this, I mean one of the purposes of both this book and, and The Emperor of All Maladies is to, is to remind us that this, you know, science is not a hallowed activity. Um, human beings within the sciences, within medicine, are just as guilty of, of, uh, of, 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 of the same desires to categorize, to discriminate. It just, it, but, it's, but it's also a reminder that there, is, that, that there, that there, there are truths. Uh, science is not fake news. Um, uh, and 
Um, it bears uh, reminding. Um, and, and the confusion caused by, the confusion caused in the clamor of our times is, is, is a smokescreen thrown up onto that idea. Um, but if you look deeply, if, if, we are, if you're able to lift the, uh, if you're able to lift the smoke screen, the, 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 the truth is self-evident. I, I believe in truths. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to actually follow you down this road because I'm, I'm, I'm interested in it. Um, what is the role of a book like this? And, and you're coming out and speaking at a moment when science is uh, questioned all the time. Uh, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot there because I'm a journalist. <laughs> well, look, uh, the, the, as I said to you before, uh, when I started writing this book, uh, it was very, uh, very self-consciously called it an intimate history. I wanted this book to be about fa my family and exploration and wanted to try to understand what it feels like to be in this moment in time. What it feels like when you can, you know, if you think about your genome as a massive encyclopedia, actually that encyclopedia would, one genome written in ACTG would cover every wall of this room, one human being's genome, three billion letters. Um, we are now learning to read or ascribe meaning to that encyclopedia, but what was more astonishing to me is that we could now, we had invented technologies that would allow you to go to, you know, volume 16, page 347, mm erase the word CG and make the word AG instead. Um, that's the kind of technology, leaving the rest of the encyclopedia untouched. I wanted to talk about all of this and talk about the ethical implications of all of this. But, the, it, but as I said to you, I, I had not expected um, the intersections, uh, the political intersections that, that occurred. Uh, I, I, I just hope people read, read the book. <laughs> you know, what else can I say? Hmm. Um, we're gonna take some questions shortly. Um, but I just want to ask you about CRISPR, um, because I, I, being the deep investigative journalist that I am, I did a Google search um, <laughs> uh, before I came here, um, and I did it actually looking for headlines, not 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 because I, um, I not because I uh, wanted to all of a sudden give you a dissertation on CRISPR, but briefly, um, it's gene editing technology. It's been in the news, um, and I did a Google search, and these are the two. Um, headlines that I came across. Could gene editing tools such as CRISPR be used as a biological weapon? Question mark. Um, all in caps. Um, and then the other one was two-thirds of Americans approve of editing human DNA to treat disease. Mm -hmm. These seem to be at odds with each other, these two headlines. And it, and it to me, spoke to the very real concerns at the moment and, 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 and the hopes um, that people have about what this technology could do for us. Uh, so th the answer is both of those are, are true. So could CRISPR technologies be used to create biological weapons? Sure. I mean, um, any time you manipulate uh, the genomes of organisms, you can manipulate the genomes of organisms and make them loaded with toxins or capable of, of introducing new disease in, into human populations. So the answer is absolutely. Uh, this is one of, just to remind us, CRISPR is, belongs to a suite of uh, technologies that allow us to intervene on the genomes of organisms, and absolutely when you intervene on the genomes of organisms, you have the capacity to uh, change the organism and make it more pathogenic, and uh, sure, that you can make mm. a biological weapon out of it. The second question, uh, also important, um, um, we don't, this is why we need to have this conversation now. Um, we have, as I told you before, if you imagine an individual's genome Three, three billion odd letters of it as an encyclopedia lining um, every wall of this uh, auditorium. These technologies now allow us to, as I said, pick out uh, page 346 on, in volume 17 um, and alter one letter to two letters in that. Um, not everything is, is, is that accurate, but nonetheless close to that. Um, but it's important, the, we have no, we, 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 are, we are struggling to find what the ethical realm and the boundaries would be for this kind of experimentation. I'm just gonna finish by saying, before we go into questions, uh, I'm gonna finish by saying that there are three, uh, the book my, my book recommends three potential boundaries, and they're important. One, we can think of them as a triangle. One edge of the triangle is that 
obviously, uh, we would like to intervene genetically on diseases that cause extraordinary suffering. Um, that should be a bright line. Um, number two, the second line of the boundary is that the, that the link between what we're trying to change and the disease should be relatively tight. Uh, in other words, there are many illnesses, many human illnesses that are not linked to one gene but have multiple genetic links, genes plus environmental links, but we have to establish that when we intervene on the genes that, that we're very confident that the link between the gene and the disease is tight. And the third one, going back to the political history of eugenics and the, and the human history of eugenics, is to remind ourselves that this should only occur with consent and it should be justifiable. We should be able to justify it um, in terms of uh, the, the individual whose genomes are being intervened upon um, and they should have freedom and consent. So these are, these are sort of three triangles. Every, you can imagine every angle of these three triangles is its own ethical debate. What is extraordinary suffering? Is it extraordinary, you know, who defines it? Are you to define it, am I to define it? What is the tightness, how, how tight do we want this link to be? Um, what does freedom mean? It, you know, if we create a coercive society, do we, do we tacitly violate the, 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 you know, the, the capacity of individuals to give consent? So of course these three are complicated uh, realms in this triangle, but at least it defines some boundaries. And that's what I recommend. Uh, who would like to ask some questions? And while people are uh, come up to the microphones, and while people are coming up, I, I, I thought of this when you, in your first answer, and I did want to ask you before we go on to questions, which is, did you scan your genes? I did not. Now, you know, we have, I, I, I work, I, I, I run a laboratory. We do genetic sequencing day in and day out. It would take me no more than, than drawing a pinprick of my own blood or spitting into a little tube to do it. I decided not to. All right. Yes, sir. Okay, hi. Thank you for coming. It was very interesting. I loved your book. Thank you. Uh, I was involved in the sociobiology debates back in the 70s. Uh -huh. And I think one of the problems I have is that, on the one hand, we want to think of science as being objective and looking at the truth. But we also have to recognize that science is an inherently political activity in terms of what, science, what questions get asked, what science get, gets funded, how it's interpreted, how the results are used. So I think we have a dilemma, really, between the, you know, what we want to think science to, is and how, and, but we have to at least recognize the fact that it, science is not inherently political, so. Well, I have no, uh, you, you know, uh, and, uh, and to be honest, both, uh, both my Thank books you. address the question of science as a, as a human and political activity. Um, I have no doubt whatsoever that this will continue way into the future. Uh, the, 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 the way we interpret data um, is ultimately, uh, uh, is ultimately, uh, altered, uh, we, we, we see it through the lenses of, of culture. That said, um, I don't believe that, the, that it's a free-for-all. Um, I, I, as I said, I do believe in truth. Um, uh, I don't think that, I think the interpretations of data are constantly changing, but we're becoming richer and, and, and more knowledgeable about what illness means, uh, what, what, what genetics means, what genes tell us about ourselves, our history, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think that it's, I think absolutely we will continue to struggle with, um, with, with the, the truth value of science and our capacity to interpret it to understand it. And this is an old struggle and we, we'll, we, we're trying, you know, we will continue to engage with this uh, through human history. I don't think that's gonna change in the, in the near future. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, over here. Thank you. Um, I, first off, I love what you're doing. I love your research. Um, I was wondering, and you said um, when you wrote your book, you predicted in the next 10 years that we would see um, that the human genome being edited, and, um, but it was actually 10 months. Um, what, um, what are the next developments you see in your uh, field? Well, the next, um, it, the next major milestone the next uh, small milestone will be the arrival of multiple, not just one, CRISPR and CRISPR edited organisms. Um, and they will climb higher and higher into the, uh, they'll climb higher and higher into the complexities of organisms. So I suspect in the next few odd uh, months, uh, we will see CRISPR edited monkeys. Um, months? Months, I would say, yeah. It would not surprise me. Um, it's certainly CRISPR edited uh, animals of various sorts, um, genetically modified in uh, whatever way. 
and then we will come to some kind of, and, and meanwhile, the human embryos, of course, the, currently, no such human embryo has ever been reimplanted or brought to term. We have no idea. There's, in fact, a big debate going on. It's as, illegal, actually, isn't it? That's in, correct. In the United States. Um, so, um, I would say it's, it, 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 the, the, it's illegal up to, beyond a certain place it becomes illegal. Um, but not so in many other countries. Exactly. Um, so, so I think in the next 20 odd months, these embryonic experiments, human embryo experiments will continue to progress um, until we're brought to that precipice. And then we have to make a big decision whether to allow or not allow the first genetic changes in human beings directed deliberately by human beings should they be introduced into human embryos or not. I think that precipice is probably coming in 20 months, 20 to 24 months. Yes. I just want that, that's a, It is a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to express my gratitude because a couple of years ago I had breast cancer. And each day that I had chemotherapy, I would come home and I would watch The Emperor of All Maladies. Thank and, you. And I'm not a scientist, I'm a librarian and archivist. So watching the history unfold uh, allowed for context that I just simply didn't have. And so as I was dealing with this personally, I was able to see what had gone on before me and what was going on in, you know, for future people. Well, suffering. thanks back to you because you're an archivist. It allowed the book to happen. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, high enough. So um, two things. Um, thank you for how well written the book was. I'm an art history major. I am not a science major, and I think that you are the first scientist I actually listened to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a professor. Um, I, the reason I picked up the book, so laying on my first point, is that I struggle with my mother has bipolar. Uh -huh. My brother was categorized as ADHD and severely medicated in the 80s, and it has led him to amplified versions of bipolar syndromes, which has gotten him in much trouble. So it's something I struggle with. Being the youngest child is, when will this come about for me? So I really appreciate your book in how it broke down, how it really gave me an understanding of the history. But what I found shocking to myself, and I guess my question to you is, were you prepared for, um, from Plato and Aristotle to Mendel and Pease to Kelly Buck, or Car Carrie Buck, sorry. Were you prepared for the female role in how this gene history has been laid out? I, it's so prevalent in one generation to the next is, it amazes me that we have, you know, Lady Justice and Lady Liberty, but the female seems to be blamed for a lot of the discrepancies in the gene. I will, I will add that I noted that myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, as I, as I wrote the book, I, I, I personally became more aware. Um, um, you know, I, I thought myself relatively well, worse, uh, well versed in, in American history. I'd never heard of Carrie Buck. Um, I had to go back and try to understand what it was like uh, to be labeled an imbecile in 1910, 1920. Um, I had not understood the, um, the role that, uh, that was ascribed to uh, heredity and, and how much of it was, how much of it was misascribed uh, because of a whole set of uh, political reasons, some of them have to, having to do with uh, our, uh, our intersection with gender. So it was, a, it was, a, it was an awakening for me as well. Um, and I'm in, intrigued by the fact that, that you picked it up um, in the book. Yes, no, yeah. it was, it, for me, it was also a bit of history that I didn't know. And secondly, it, it, it struck a chord with me as well that, the, yeah. that frequently um, women minorities are often the targets of, of um, scientific um, Experiments. In fact, <laughs> Science, you, politics. Yeah. <laughs> the, in fact, the eugenics project continued in the United States um, on African Americans uh, mm -hmm. way into the 1950s and 60s, um, long extending beyond the, uh, what's known about it. Extraordinary. Yes, sir. Hi. <clears throat> I'm from Mumbai on holiday here, and I'm a big fan. I hit the jackpot today when I checked up the events and I saw you were speaking. <laughs> so. <laughs> 
So my question is on longevity. How soon before we have uh, humans living for 200 years or more? Yeah. <laughs> So, um, that day is always supposed to come, <laughs> apparently, so I'm curious um, myself. Well, the, the, uh, uh, the, the longevity demands a long answer, so, um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll try to be We've brief. We've got five minutes. <laughs> there, there, are a couple of, there are two Stunning. or three ways that I think about longevity. Um, I, I'll go from the least provocative to the most provocative. The least provocative is uh, removing, the, it's, it's, it's a double negative, killing all the killers, removing the, uh, pro, the removing the, uh, diseases, the illnesses that place, place natural restrictions on human uh, age. Cancer, heart disease, and neurological illnesses would be the highest on that list. So the, the, as we eliminate them, of course, human lifespans are, will, thought to, will, will increase. So that's, that's, that's vision one. Um, vision two is uh, more complicated. Vision two is not a negative vision, but a positive vision. Can we, are there genes that we can, or pathways, or things that we can intervene on that allow us to increase uh, longevity um, in, a in a way, not by killing the killers, but by increasing the human body's capacity to live longer. And in fact, there are. There are metabolic pathways, there are genes. We're discovering more and more of them um, in, in lower or other animals and extending those data into human beings. The third one I'll leave you as a thought experiment. I'm, I'm writing a little bit about it. The third one I'll leave you as a thought experiment. Another possibility is um, to clone yourself um, and uh, to then implant through um, some kind of um, deep learning techniques um, your voice, some of your memories, including memories of your trauma, etc., to this genetic clone of yourself. Mm. We are edging, we won't come there, but we're edging towards technologies that allow us to achieve these technologically. Um, I, I just pose this as a thought experiment. Uh, what if I would allow, what if I would think about creating a clone of a self, genetically identical, and then passing on um, some of these uh, memories, traumas, histories to that clone? Would that, is that longevity? I don't know, but think of that as a mind-bending experiment for a That's second. That's a happy thought to leave everyone with. <laughs> Um, we have two minutes left. I, I, I just want to come back to the ethical implications of all the things that you just said very briefly. Have, has the technology surpassed our ability to regulate it to, to actually make sure that some of these things that we've only seen in movies uh, come to pass? I think the, the feeling across the, the scientific community is that there's, it's getting time to hit the pause button for a little bit. Um, because the, and, and it's getting time. This is, as I said, this is, this is not trivial stuff. This is intervention on the human genome, editing the human genome deliberately. It's a conversation that people in laboratories with white coats cannot have uh, in and of themselves, within themselves. It's your genome. We have all of this in custody uh, across all human beings, so you have to be able to have this conversation as w widely and broadly as possible, and therefore you need you me, we all need to know the vocabulary, we need to understand the technology, that, what's fantasy, what's not fantasy, what's possible, what's not possible, where the lines are, what, what nations draw what lines, uh, what we have allowed, what others have allowed, what, what we're, we're doing, etc., etc. And this has to be a, an international conversation. So I think in the scientific community there is every day increasing cognizance that we sort of need to hit the pause button uh, for a little bit before moving on. And I think within, again, within the next 10 odd months, we will begin to see, uh, I, I know many of them already because they're in draft form, um, we will begin to see uh, uh, very public acknowledgements that we need to have stronger boundaries, international boundaries. We can't do something if China is doing something else. We can't do something if India is gonna have different rules. Um, how to negotiate those boundaries based on ethical precepts. Uh, the conception of what, what, an, you know, what, what life uh, or the life of an embryo is, is different between cultures. So we have to respect and understand that. But at the same time, because it's the human genome that we're talking about, this has to be a conversation that all of us need to have together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please, round of applause. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.